Welcome back to the Primal Lifestyle. And today I've got a fantastic guest. She, before um, we've recorded this, she sent me a, a bio of, of her story. And all I can say is, wow. And I am so proud of this lady. And I am so honored to have the opportunity to interview her. So let's get over to her now. Kimmy, welcome to the channel. Hi, Carl. It's so great to finally meet you online. But I know we've spoken back and forth a few times through Messenger. It's good to finally see your face. <laughs> yep. So would you like to do a very brief introduction to you now? And then we'll go into your story for, for the listeners to, to watch. Sure. My name is Kimmy. I live in sunny Florida. Um, I will be 50 years old in January. And I've been eating an animal-based diet consistently for two years. The proper human diet has given me a new life, and I'm here to share my amazing story of transformation. Cool. Right. So you sent me you sent me a bio of your your history, and and I think honestly it was very powerful to read, and and I had to read it a couple of times because certain parts of it is quite emotional, really. So. So let's go back to where you start off with, where you talk about the fairground. So do you want to take us, take us back to there? Yes, that was a pivotal event in my story. About 20 years ago, I found myself at a state fair with my then husband, his sister, and her husband. I remember being about 330 pounds at the time. And one of the fair attractions that caught my eye is called the Scrambler. It's this carnival ride that resembles a spider twisting and turning. As a teenager, I love that ride. I mustered up the courage to give it a try. I vividly recall trying to suck in my stomach as the attendant tried to secure the restraint, only to be told uh, I wouldn't fit, I wasn't fitting, and to get off the ride. That wow. Yeah, that walk, walking back to my waiting family was one of the most difficult moments for me. It directly affected my self-esteem. I felt fat shame because there were people still in line pointing fingers and giggling. It was, it was emotional. So what did you decide to do from that event? Well, I walked up to my sister-in-law and I told her, I'm having gastric bypass surgery. I'm fed up. And within two years, I did. Okay, so if I flash up the first picture you you shared with me, do you want to talk us through through this particular these two particular? They're, no, they're not the clearest of pictures, but you know, I think they give us a clear idea. Yes, they're very old. That on the left is before gastric bypass surgery. So that's roughly what I look like when I got removed from the The one on the right is about a year, maybe a year and a half post bypass surgery. So, so a big difference in terms of weight, a massive transition in, in terms of weight, yes? Yes. And and I look I look pretty good in that picture. You know, I was happy. So do you want to tell us about that process that, you know, going through the gastric bypass? Yes. Another process to have surgery took at least a year. I can't remember the whole timeline. That was in 2005 or 2004 when I was going through the process. I had to go through a six month medically supervised diet. Each month, the doctor reduced my calories until I was down to below uh, 1200. He knew full well that I was not restricting myself to 1200 calories. I just told him I was, and he wrote it down that I was adhering to the plan, but still not really losing much. So that was part of the reason why I needed surgery in his notes. That's what he told my insurance company. So I had to have a lot of tests leading up to surgery, my breathing, my heart, you know, all sorts of tests. It was expensive just to get approved. But, you know, even though done laparoscopically, it's a major surgery. It was very painful. There were several months uh, before I felt good. My recovery period was complicated by stricture. That is when the scar tissue closed over the narrow emptying, the part where the stomach empties. It's life-threatening. I could not hold down even a thimble of water. I would lie down 
and the water would just flow back up my esophagus into my mouth. It's a life-threatening condition. So I called my surgeon. He called the hospital ahead of time. He said, go now. He called the hospital ahead of time as a direct admission for fluid and an upper endoscopy. So I was in the hospital about three days. That hospital stay was roughly about $30,000. They stretched my stomach or the pouch uh, that is a created stomach. They stretched it to save my life. Wow. So the, the, with the gastric, it's they, they close the stomach. They don't take a part of the stomach away, do they? Or, or, or do they take a part of it away? Well, I, heard, I had RU and Y, uh, R and Y gastric bypass, and they do close off and they don't remove it, but move to the side and then create a pouch. It becomes your stomach. Right. So I've got my dog. He's trying to get some attention. Sorry. I'll have asked someone to take you away for me. Right. Right. Okay. So you obviously had the complications and they obviously what they stretch the stomach to give you a bit of relief. Yes. Yes, the whole process uh, to get approved was methodical, a little tedious, but not difficult. I wanted to circle around, though, to the fact that the surgeon's office was well versed in getting insurance to approve the surgery for their patients. And it's not always completely truthful. Uh, the doctor that was doing my medical supervised diet, the surgeon uh, to perform my surgery, the test that I went through, my point that I definitely want to make is the industry for gastric bypass or all weight loss surgeries is definitely money driven. It is not, the benefit of the patient is not their priority. Okay, so so obviously that was quite a journey for you then. And obviously you, you, you got the main ambition which was to lose the weight, but how did that affect you mentally? How did that affect you in other parts of your life? Well, the first maybe two years, I call it a honeymoon phase. After the stricture was corrected, the weight was melting off of me. I felt energy from the ketones, you know, because I was basically starving. I was in ketosis. My vitamin stores held up a long time. My poor body <laughs> hung in there for a long time. But right around my two-year anniversary, mm -hmm. my issues started to pile up. The first most significant issue was I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder because my moods have become so erratic. But I know we'll talk about that a little more later. But I, got a, I don't really have too many pictures of me before gastric bypass surgery. So that's why I don't have more. But, you know, like I said in that picture post gastric bypass, I'm looking vibrant, thin, smiling in the picture. I thought mm -hmm. I had smartest yeah, I'll, I'll, get, I'll flash it back up again hang on two seconds i'll just quickly get it back up so you can see yeah perfect so i was looking vibrant thin smiling i thought i'd made the smartest decision in my life this was perfect because thin people are happy right they're popular they have great jobs i thought this was the answer to all my problems but there was a severe storm brewing under the surface so shall we venture into that area yeah, well, I want to tell you in the process for getting weight loss surgery, there is a pre-surgical psychological assessment. This was a mere facade of health, health consciousness though. Addictive tendencies are not identified, much less addressed before the surgery. And naturally the operation is not on your brain, your mind, but just to keep the story more concise, I will say that I fully transferred my food addiction to a substance in 2009, and that substance was alcohol. Four years after gastric bypass surgery, I was 34 years old. Okay, so obviously alcohol in the body becomes glucose. So you kind of taken your sugar addiction and replaced it with a liquid addiction. Yes, I was addicted to sugar, still am addicted to sugar. And this sugar sent me into oblivion this was that also you know had the alcohol effect so i wouldn't have to feel anything at all and i would drink then heavily for a good majority of the next 14 years it was a disaster okay so i, I take it things are good for you now on that front yes of course 
I did want to tell you about the abusive relationship that I was in, which was the reason that I sought oblivion. A lot of reasons for addiction is because there's a dark side to someone's life. So you were, you obviously were married and you were, as you, you, your words in an abusive relationship. So you were using food or then alcohol as your get, get away from it scenario. Yes. Yes. I was seeking an escape. I actually, I call myself an escape artist. Or sometimes now I call myself a retired blackout artist, you know, because I don't drink. But long story short, I was eating my feelings and then drinking my feelings. I ate my way back up to nearly 400 pounds at my heaviest, even though I'd lost all that weight from the surgery. Um, and a lot of, most patients do well for a few years. Some aren't even that lucky, they die. Some just suffer in various ways from different medical conditions for the rest of their life. But the alcohol, combined with the carby soft foods that felt good in that pouch that was created that was very picky about foods the high cal calorie wine and the carby foods put every pound back on me that i had lost through surgery plus another 30. so you're not only back to square one you're in a worse state and you've got an issue with alcohol yes i ended up morbidly obese again but with a ton of medical conditions okay so you must have been quite in a you must have been in a very dark place yes and as my medical because not only dealing of course with the addiction and the mental thinking erratic moods the exhaustion from things like anemia i'll go into it was just the perfect storm of disaster. Yeah. So did your life continue to spiral downwards from there? Or did you see the light at that point to change? Or do you want to sort of explain a bit more for how, how you went from there? It took a long time. I drank heavily and was miserable and in the trap of addiction cycles. I might stop for a short period, period of time and feel a little bit better, but the medical conditions and the food I was eating made everything wor you know, worse emotionally. So just trying to deal with basic life, typical stressors that all adults deal with, I couldn't even deal with that. So you're in this dark place where you've, you're, how did you feel about yourself going from having the surgery, doing the brave thing of having the surgery, losing all the weight, and then finding yourself back in a worse position than you were. How, how did that affect you mentally? Well, physically, my vitamin and mineral stores were falling fast. The supplements I was supposed to take aggravated that a created pouch the, or, or made me vomit. To this day, I have to take my supplements by either um, injection, sublingual, a nasal spray, liquid, maybe a capsule. I can't take any extended release or coated tablets. I can't take NSAIDs, which are things like ibuprofen and naproxen. I will be on supplements for the rest of my life. For example, the part of my stomach that absorbs B12 is bypassed. So I can only get that by injection, nasal spray, or sublingual. Um, right. That's yeah. interesting. So obviously that gastric is not the fix all everything. It, it comes with a, a baggage of problems then. Indeed. So if anyone was thinking of having the gastric sleeve, what would you say to them based on your experience? And again, it's only your personal view. It's not medical advice, but it's just be interested to see what your point of view is. I have a circle of gastric bypass friends. And I have people that have contacted me to hear my story, to get advice on, you know, when they're seeking surgery. And I am passionately against it, which obviously, if anybody listens to my journey, they would know why. But I will say that I remember being so convinced that surgery was the answer. And I got uh, almost brainwashed by all the positives in those people a few years out of surgery and showing pictures, glamorous pictures, I thought, 
of them living a wonderful life. You know, they're thin, they're traveling, everything's great, you know. So I don't know if anybody telling me back then would have necessarily even changed my mind, which is sad. Mm. Well, unfortunately, especially in America, I mean, it's, it's coming that way over here in the UK, but in America, sick people are a big business. It's profit. And, I, and, and you touched upon it early on, on on some of the recent stuff that I've done. I've pointed out that margin is more important than people's health in, in certain eyes, or I may be being a bit harsh saying that, but that is a perception that I have around big, big pharma. Yes. I then developed a suspicious mass in my breast. So we'll get to that later. That story is a fun story. Okay. But I had life altering insomnia. I was awake for up to five days, a few points, and had to be sedated in the hospital. Which is, you know, that's quite drastic yeah. action, isn't it? Yeah, my moods um, were just all over the place from mania to severe depression. So I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, type 2 at that point, which I had already started being on meds, uh, various meds. This added more meds, um, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, anxiety medicine. So several medications were added uh, to the ones I was already taking, all the supplements I was taking. And then with that little pouch, there were so many times I was taking so many supplements and trying to eat food. There just wasn't even any room in my stomach for it. Right. So you're in this worse position than you were when you started. You've got this ad issue with addiction as well as your abusive relationship. So what actions did you take? To okay, so a few years ago, I discovered a Facebook group exclusively created to support people like me that have transferred an addiction after a weight loss surgery. There's just shy of 12,000 people in this group. It's been instrumental in my recovery. The creator of the group is a close friend of mine, but this surgery ne nearly ruined a lot of people's lives. In my opinion, it's medical malpractice, which is illegal, um, to perform the vast majority of operations on these people, most especially on patients that either have addict tendencies or a family history of addiction. It is proven that a third of all weight loss surgery patients develop a serious transfer addiction. And this can be any illicit substance, prescribed medication, or even behaviors. Some people turn to gambling, sex, or shopping. So, and you're, you obviously fell into that category. Yes, I will say that there was a precursor that should have been a warning sign when I was diagnosed with bipolar, bipolar disorder and prescribed anxiety medicine, I was given benzodiazepines. Now, it should have been a warning sign because I abused them almost immediately. One of my suicide attempts, I've had three. One of my suicide attempts, uh, I took an entire bottle of 30 clonopin and drank three liters of wine. Now, when I woke up at the hospital, the doctor no longer no longer prescribed that drug. So that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. But that tells you where the dark place you're in if you felt that your only option was to take your life. That's how erratic my moods were. So did the group, did you find the group helpful? Did they start the, the right direction for you? Was that a, a core bit? You know, people suffering addictions and that may find solace in something like this? Yes, I finally didn't feel alone. I realized that this was all created when I had the gastric bypass surgery. I also found out that addiction is genetic. You can actually test a newborn infant and determine if they have the tendency to have addiction. I found out that I'm not broken, I'm sick. I have a medical disorder, but what's great is there's a treatment to manage that. Yeah, my, my understanding, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I was an addict, but 
I could have easily ended up with a gambling issue. At the time when I had plenty of money, I would go and play poker and I'd blow large sums of money. I still play poker occasionally, but I play for £20 and it's more about the fun and the atmosphere and winding up your opponent than it is to, about the winning. But So I think we all have a level, but as you say, if you've, you're in that field and you're trying to run away from other things and the addiction becomes your your motivator to carry on, then it's a, a big problem for people. So well done you for, for doing that. So do you want to briefly tell us a little bit about your, your story of how you came out of the abusive relationship and managed to, I understand your friend supported you? Yes. Um, well, I will say that as my health continued to deteriorate, um, that was so hard for me to get out of it. I was dealing with so much medically physically, um, spiritually, um, emotionally. It was just the perfect storm of, of disaster, uh, metabolic disaster in every way of disaster. Uh, the anemia made me exhausted. I was pale as a ghost. Uh, the doctor that discovered my critically low ferritin, hematocrit, hemoglobin said they were in the tank. He said if I had any kind of accident, that had a blood loss, I'd be in a dire medical situation. The pills that they prescribed me made me vomit, made me constipated. So I ended up having 14 IV iron infusions at one point, just to bring my level up to the bare minimum of acceptable. Now this re required laying on a bed in a chemo lab due to the risk of anaphylactic shock. Now this procedure took half a day, 14 times, while I was trying to run a homeschooling household of four children, while my husband at the time worked long hours on his job. So quite a challenge. Exactly. I also developed such severe life-threatening insomnia that I would get suicidal from the lack of sleep. So I'd be awake for like five days at some points and had to be sedated. It was just crazy. The, and the antipsychotic, the mood stabilizers made me even hungrier. Uh, that's a side effect of a lot of psych meds. It made me foggy headed. So I, I, I was just, everything was, was just going wrong. There's also something called dumping syndrome that gastric bypass patients experience. I would get so ill after just a half a teaspoon of some ketchup. Like when I went to a, a restaurant to have like a maybe a, a patty of hamburger patty for my meal, I couldn't even put a, a tiny bit of ketchup. And what dumping syndrome is, it makes you have abdominal cramps, diarrhea, vomiting, dizziness, rapid heartbeat, sweating. It results in a very low blood sugar situation, just overall fatigue. So that's not fun. <laughs> no, that sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. So the next 14 years was just very chaotic. I overcame homelessness six times. I had a negative bank account numerous times. I had unfavorable interactions with law enforcement. I had psychiatric stays in hospitals. I detoxed from substances more times than I cared to count. I was not the best employee on my jobs. I got physically sicker and sicker. I was hurting all over. And then I got diagnosed with fibromyalgia and the doctor put me on four more pills. One of them was a pain pill and I got addicted to that. And honestly, when I was reading this about your story, it's, it's, and I use the expression ironically from our starting, but your life has been a complete roller coaster. I'm very much on the downslope as well. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's incredible. So how did you turn it around? Come on, let's take some positives now. How did yes. you manage to, to, you know, to see the light and go forward? Well, you know, my mainstream doctors kept telling me the same stupid information over and over. I knew it didn't even work for me. It didn't ever work for me. Mutilating my stomach didn't work for long because it was a Band-Aid and that Band-Aid fell off, exposing the true wound in my mind. I had had some success with Atkins before, and when it was viral, 
uh, it was all the fad. You know, I had done that and had a little bit of success with traditional keto, the Atkins keto. But I ended up leaving a second relationship, a bad relationship I got in. And thankfully, I love myself enough. I I, I fixed that choosing terrible relationship. That's another addiction, isn't it? Finding the wrong type of relationship because you're just fumbling around in what you're doing. So it's a, a natural yes. state to find yourself in. I didn't like myself, so I attracted the wrong circle of people. But I wanted a better job than I had. You know, there was so much that I wanted, a positive outlook on life. I wanted to love myself. Uh, but the room of transfer addiction or the group of that transfer addiction site that I'm a belong to introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. Through working the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, as it is spelled out in the big book, as we call it, the book of Alcohol Anonymous, I met people that just had a positive outlook on life. They had overcome those demons and they, they, lo they love life. They laughed, you know, they were successful. There's some solid people in the rooms of, LA, of AA, I'm telling you. But I just remember thinking the insanity of my life had to stop, had to stop. And I had met people that had successfully done that. And I wanted what they had. So I started doing what they had done. And at the same time, I became more interested in nutrition. I was back in my keto groups. And some people had mentioned carnivore. It led me into researching the science behind that. Now, after I started studying it on the internet, studies and doctors that did teach it, I, I come across uh, Dr. Ken Berry. And he's my favorite. He's mm -hmm. His personal experience and expert knowledge is, is critical to my success so far. Now, I do have more goals to reach, so I still reach out and, and watch his, all his information and read his books and all. Also, he introduced me to Stoicism, which is an ancient philosophy, but it started to improve my mind. The tools I was learning in AA, the diet changes that I was making, the positive outlook also through Stoicism, it all started coming together to learn how to live my life successfully. So it's a three prong uh, approach to my success, but they do all, they're interwoven. I couldn't have one without the other. Hmm. So you started to deal with the addiction. You start to eat better. You got into out of a bad relationship and getting yourself sorted. So. First, I'll say, and I said this to you in previous correspondence with you, pat yourself on the back because you clearly are one of these people that has gone through hell several times and you still come out the right side because of that inner strength, that inner you is there. So well done for what you've done and, and, and absolutely brilliant. So do you, where do you want to talk about now? Because there is so much content you've sent us. I, I can... You know, we, we could be here for about a week. So, um, do well, you, I will do you... tell you um, how, I, how I got off of the traditional Atkins keto and went all the way on, over to carnivore. Yeah, uh, let's go there. Yeah, so I started realizing these keto, you know, were having some success, but then these carnivores were having more success. And they were just, you know, looked and sounded even so much better. And I saw how much healing had been from so many of these people with a lot of my same issues. So I started getting rid of the garbage. I call it the garbage. So, you know, even whole grains, it's all garbage. It all turns to sugar. So I got rid of all, all that, you know, the fruit, the vegetables, the ultra processed Atkins snacks I was buying in the, in the stores. You know, I started researching about the oxalates and the plants and I started to get more strict and strict every day. And I continued to start to feel better and better every day. I was sleeping better. I had more energy, clarity in my thought. Alcohol cravings were eliminated. I was losing weight uh, without, it wasn't hard. It was just coming off and I wasn't hungry and having to count all the calories and stuff. I wasn't exercising uh, yet. And I started, my fibromyalgia was so much better. I have very few flares uh, of pain. And when I do, I can just take like over the counter Tylenol or ibuprofen. It's not even prescription strength, you know, but talking about exercise, my fitness journey, I'm, I'm embarking on next. So I had managed to put on 15 pounds of lean muscle mass without exercising yeah. in the past two years. Oh. Of 
I'll flash up your what you sent me about your. So this is your records on on your muscle mass, isn't it? So without really exercising, you have built up more solid muscle, which is interesting. Because like myself, I, I've just I've literally just passed my one year on carnivore, and I haven't other than walking the dog, I've done pretty much zero exercise. But my muscle tone and my muscle density is clearly improved, and it's bizarre. Now, admittedly, I did sports at a younger age at quite a decent level, so I've got the the background muscle there. But obviously, turning into a sumo at one time, I I let it all go. So, you know, so I'm, I really get where you're coming from, you know. So I didn't even mention how swollen I was. I was on two type of diuretic water pills because I was so swollen, especially in my legs. I couldn't even fit my feet in my shoes lots of days. And all that went away on carnivore. I was able to come off of both of those medicines. I can wear tennis shoes now and lace them up. I couldn't imagine doing that. And now my pant size is five pounds, five sizes smaller, my pant size, because my legs were so swollen. I actually, I found out I have lipedema. They say that lipedema will never get smaller. It can only be managed to not get any bigger. But my legs, I've lost five pant sizes. So obviously it can be fixed. Well, I, I, I found I my feet shrunk two shoe sizes. And I didn't, and and I that was like what? My only complaint about the carnivore lifestyle is it's so expensive only because new of the wardrobe. The new wardrobe was expensive. <laughs> That is the downside of it. Well, what a great problem to have, hey? What a great problem to have. So yeah. we've got some other medical bits that you shared with me, but there's one story I think is the perfect timing now is your your actual journey on a roller coaster. So do you want to touch upon that? And I'll just put this picture up, which I think sums it up absolutely brilliantly. So after you had that horrible experience 20 years ago of not being allowed on a ride, you you did this. So tell us about that. Yes. Well, right before I do, I'll tell you the fun story about my breast mass. Was yeah, we can do. Yeah, I've got your mandogram stuff here as well that you shared with yes, us. So. Yes, yes, yes. Because every six months for several years, I had a diagnostic mammogram and then a, a sonogram to watch that mass in my breast. So after I'd been carnivore for about a year, I went to have um, a diagnostic mammogram and I was six months overdue. I had moved to Florida and it took me a while to set up a doctor. So it'd been a year since I'd had, or a year and a half since I'd had a mammogram. And after the initial mammogram, radiology left the room and came back and left the room and came back. They asked me a bunch of questions. Um, and then they come back the third time and said, we're canceling your sonogram. There's nothing in your breast. It was gone. See, I love the bit when you say that they came back and asked you for ID because they wasn't sure if you were an imposter of yourself. Yes, they asked identity verification questions and then they wanted to make sure they had the right films from my past doctor in Alabama. And it's completely gone. Yes. And I reduced my cholesterol ratio by 0.25 and healed my thyroid from iodine alone. Yeah, I've got your your thyroid stuff there as well. So, so you've right. So let's get this right. Let's get this this right. So you, you've got past addictions, various different addictions. You've got out of a nasty relationship. You've started to lose control of your weight much more better. You're in a much better place. You've made any issues you had in your your breast go away. You've corrected your thyroid. This is. This is almost people wouldn't believe this story if they, you know, it, it is striking and amazing. And what I've got, I've got a couple, you've sent me a couple of your before and afters. So let's, let's just, let's just cover some of these. So you've got this one it's where you've lost. Yeah, it's great to look at it because my medication went from 12 pills to four. And, and, and I tell people, I think they think I'm about to try to sell them something because I'm like, you lose the weight without really trying. It healed all my medical conditions. The information is free. You know, you, you don't, you just go to the store and buy real food. And I always think they're like, yeah, what are you selling? Like this, this is magic, right? So 
what does your diet consist of now? You know, are, are you strict carnivore? Are you 90% a bit like myself where I'm not 100% carnivore? I have, I allow coffee and things like that into my diet occasionally. Yes. Well, I call myself a lipivore carnivore because 80% of my food comes from animal fat. Uh, the other 20% comes from actual flesh meat. I'm also a little on the relaxed side like you because I use spices. I drink coffee and tea. But uh, no, I don't, I don't eat any seed oils. I do organic and I support local farms when I can. Uh, I get clean meat from my butcher. There's no hormones, vaccines, antibiotics. So, oh, my dairy. I try to limit myself to two ounces of dairy. It affects me when I'm trying to lose. I do love dairy and occasionally have extra dairy. But if I'm trying to lose that week or, you know, then I, I limit it to two ounces. I do love fish and seafood. I love cod liver, not the oil, but the actual livers. It is a delicacy and carnivore uh, for me. If you like a light tasting fish, I encourage you to try it. Um, it needs new branding because the word cod liver sounds revolting. Uh, yeah. It's very, it's a very light, buttery, creamy consistency. Um, it's not livery. It's, it's barely even fishy. It's just great. Um, but I'll mix it with some other fish like salmon, mackerel, herring, even a high quality tuna filet and I'll mix it all up. It's a nutritional powerhouse of a meal. Yeah, I love herring. So I think herrings, you know, I have them brought absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, my story ends with a wonderful roller coaster ride back at the fair. Yeah, I'll get that picture because I just think it is such a happy picture. <laughs> yes. That is I'll... someone like at last. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was given a, an impromptu mini vacation recently to the Mall of America in Minnesota. And that had always been on my bucket list to, to visit the Mall of America. It's the biggest mall in the U.S. It's so huge. There's three roller coasters inside the mall. There's a whole theme park inside this huge mall. And I was telling a girlfriend about it, about me taking that vacation. And she was the one that said, there's roller coasters in that mall. And I looked it up and, and there they are. And when she told me, it reminded me, I went back to that fair ride. I had not been on any carnival fair rides since that day. It would have been like 2003 maybe. And I thought, could I fit? You know, I Googled the, the requirements online and it said they could easily take, you know, fit up to 400 pounds. But I was thinking, nah, I know how small some of those rides can be, you know. But it ended up, I had the hope and excitement that I could. And sure enough, not only did I not have to use any seatbelt extenders on my four flights there and back, I comfortably fit and rode two roller coasters and I felt so alive. It was amazing to be in recovery that day and be fully present. It felt like freedom. Brilliant. Awesome. That's, that is, that is just awesome. So where are you at now? Based on your worst weight to where you are now, what, what weight have you lost so far? I've lost 115 pounds. I, I no longer need to worry about. I think this is the accurate one, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I no longer need to worry about being homeless. I now actually live between two residences in two different states. This is easy to accomplish because I have an amazing new remote job that my higher power gave to me and that I earned through my hard work. I no longer need to worry about affording my basic needs. I live a secure life emotionally too. Um, I'm a law-abiding citizen, so no more of those unfavorable interactions with law enforcement. I'm mentally stable. I've lost uh, so much of that weight. I'm still not done. Whenever I do go off plan, um, and I call it off plan because I hate the word cheat, um, mm -hmm. but I choose the keto friendly treats. Um, like one of my favorite is a sheet milk yogurt with a handful of fresh berries. So I might do berries or some low starch vegetables, but I still struggle at times. You know, uh, on that vacation, I had a few bites of a cake. I have the coffee every morning. Uh, I feel like I'm dependent on that because I get a headache if I don't have any. So that's an addiction. I was able to quit smoking. I'm vaping, but I'm working on that. Progress, not perfection. So 
First thing I'll say there, there are no, and I tell this every time, there are no carnivore police. So if you do have a little, what's the expression you use? Not cheating? What did you call it? Off, off. Um, make, making an off plan choice. So when you go off plan, don't worry about it because you're thickened to the core and you're, you've addressed a lot of your issues and you're doing absolutely phenomenal. Honestly, I am so honoured and proud to have met you and read your story. And I mean, we've just scratched the surface of it, but we're, we're nearly 50 minutes into the recording. And, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's just an incredible story. So you've also reduced the medication that you're on. So what is your future hold you? What's your target going forward? What do you want to achieve? Let's see, I probably want to lose maybe another 50 pounds. I'm embarking on a fitness journey. I want to get in shape. I want to tone up. I have a lot of loose skin from the massive weight loss. I would like to, I'm, I'm doing a lot of extended fasting every often or every so often. Autophagy, I've got some healing, you know, of the loose skin. I deal with a little bit of acid reflux. A lot of that is just due to the gastric bypass surgery, and I'm hoping to heal that soon. So I've got some goals, some things that I definitely want to, I started sponsoring in AA. It is my goal to continue self-growth. And tonight, you know, I, I want to end by saying um, I do not hate my past. I've been through a lot, but I'm a success today because I went through all of that. You know, Dr. Seuss has a quote, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. And I'm here today because of all that. See, I always say your history gets you to now. And without the history, you wouldn't be here now. So you've got the right attitude. And I would love that if you, you know, in six months down the line, we do a catch up and an update to see how your journey goes. But honestly, Kimmy, I'm generally honoured and pleased to have met you. I, I'm pretty confident you and I are going to remain good friends and keep the communication going, although you are you are slightly crazy in terms of all the plates you're spinning and all the activities you're doing. You explained that to her, and I'm like, I'm never going to get a time to interview this lady. She's she's so busy, busy. So I'd just like to thank you for joining us and, and really appreciate you sharing your very personal story. Again, I can't thank you anymore. So I'd just like to say thank you very much and thank you for everyone that's been watching this and I hope you've got something from it. Thank you for watching. 